David Fetterman. I will be uh, pretty straightforward, really focused on empowerment evaluation, and I'm going to be highlighting some some of the technical uh, and technological tools that we, we use as we use empowerment evaluation. And the aim is really from the one the focus I'll have today is on stakeholder involvement and getting them involved in in social change, uh, social justice. Um, for those who want to read more about youth, I'll just tell you right away, in our latest empowerment evaluation book, the one with the earth on it, that's the one where we have even fourth graders doing empowerment evaluation in their school systems. Uh, very impressive. Um, so let's keep on moving forward, like you say. And uh, evaluation can be like a bridge over troubled waters. This is me. Uh, many of you may or may not know I climbed with my family to uh, Mount Everest Base Camp uh, all of September. I've never taken a full month off in my life, and we, we did it. And it's pretty exciting. But I, I think evaluation can be like a bridge over troubled water. A lot of issues and that you have to deal with all the time, and, and uh, evaluation can really be very powerful, uh, you know, reaching and extending from one uh, part of the world that we, we operate in to another uh, in social programs, in uh, uh, academic areas, you name it. But before we really take off, you should really look at the landscape before embarking on a trek or a journey. Uh, there's also the view from some of the mountains that we were up, up in at that time. Um, so when you're looking at stakeholder involvement approaches, I like Chris's little cartoon. You know, empowerment's not the only way to go. And like Eric said, you don't want to have just one approach that you go by and that's it. Even though if you, even in my case, I may have created empowerment evaluation, it's not the only approach in the world. It depends on what the problem is. You don't want the methodological t uh, tail wagging the dog. So Chris did this beautiful cartoon we have in our new book that just came out this year, where in collaborative approaches, um, the evaluator still are looking from a role of an evaluation, uh, the evaluator. Uh, the evaluator is still in charge, but you, they want you to collaborate and work with them to make this all happen. In participatory, it's more we're sharing the experience uh, and the control of the evaluation. And with empowerment, this is, you're basically saying it's just evaluation, just like Eric and others have been talking about, except you turn it upside down, where they're in charge and you're the coach and critical friend. I think this just broad strokes kind of a fast way of highlighting what the differences are from a role of an evaluator perspective. And if you're going to focus on stakeholder involvement approaches, you really should look at the landscape as, as in this regard and see what's the best appro appropriate, the best and appropriate approach for the, what you have in mind and what the task is at hand. Anyway, that's why we wrote this book. We pulled this together, took all these, you know, prima donnas, including myself, and uh, said, you know what, none of us have the only approach. Let's, let's see if we can help everyone uh, of our colleagues select the most appropriate one for the task at hand. Anyway, so that's very broad, broad stroke, so bear with me. Uh, and uh, that's sort of the, 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 the big picture. You want the details and case examples, uh, look at the, the book itself. Uh, and empowerment evaluations, what I'll focus on, though, for our, our brief presentation and discussion today. Um, and I just want to let you know it's we're working in 16 different countries, uh, Finland, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia. And we learn as much as they hope to get from what we're doing to facilitate their work. Uh, we work in squatter settlements in South Africa, as well as in places like Google. Um, and the key for all of the work that we do, is all the stakeholder involvement approaches, is really um, that there only has to be a desire for a better life of one sort or another. It could be in, in uh, townships, uh, squatter settlements. It could be in corporate areas. It could be in um, nonprofits. If you look on the left, you can see this woman there who's I've talked with a long time in the squatter settlement. And if you don't know what those are, they're basically t like 20, 25,000 people at a shot living in a community with no electricity, very little water. Um, it's just a very almost impossible kind of life circumstance. Um, but if you look on the right, in, this, in that kind of center, in that kind of center, that kind of a town, there's a child care or daycare kind of center where there's a desire for a better life for the next generation. And that's my son. Well, we're hiking up toward the uh, Himalayas and stuff. And all of it begins with that, with our children. If you have that as your focus, you're thinking then generationally in terms of having an impact and helping people. What I want to do is just extremely briefly just touch on some examples of empowerment evaluation work that we're doing uh, in the Arkansas schools. We work on um, academic distress, helping uh, kids uh, and schools uh, actually reach and, impact and have an impact on, uh, on kids 
so that in this case, we're measuring it by uh, academic scores, uh, by standardized tests, um, and uh, attendance, you name it, um, to see if they're actually progressing and getting out of academic distress. You at Packet, we had a $15 million uh, uh, project to bridge the digital divide uh, in, in communities of color. And this, we have a whole book on that that Stanford Press uh, published. That's me in the middle, in the middle there teaching in my class. Uh, and if you can see the top of the screen, it's actually a screen of um, Native Americans that we're working with, where they're learning to use technology to communicate with our class and uh, also of the world. Uh, they also have the, well, according to the uh, former FCC head, they have one of the largest wireless systems in the country based on using this kind of approach. It's one of the reasons I asked Eric about the question of, does our work, whatever form we take of evaluation, become part of the intervention? And I think he's, he was completely right, yes. Uh, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, most of us who are immersed in evaluation know that we're having an impact, even by asking key questions, having people crystallize what they're doing, uh, we're having an impact. This one's even more direct because it's part of the, it becomes part of the planning and, and, and management of the operation and empowerment evaluation. Anyway, I'll move quick. I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we also use it at Stanford uh, to help them get through accreditation. Uh, so empowerment, empowerment evaluation is very popular in accreditation circles because they want people to self-assess. They want them to participate and help shape what's going on rather than always being an external force. A couple more examples, very fast moving today. Uh, in Arkansas, it's I think our 13th year, uh, we're uh, doing empowerment evaluation, having uh, 22 different nonprofits, and they could be small mom and pop kind of shops, to universities, to hospitals, all involved in uh, keeping minority kids particularly awake from tobacco. And we've been extremely successful uh, once we learn the power of language, which is often money. Uh, in other words, we took the number of kids that we uh, got to stop smoking, all of our different programs, and the legislature, were, legislature, the legislature was folks who were kind of, that was all right, interesting, nice. But when we translated it into money, uh, how much money we're saving, we showed them, by the way, we saved about 83 to $94 million in excess medical costs that would have been paid out by the state uh, by uh, implementing these programs. Um, they were receptive, they listened and they kept the funding going. Uh, otherwise they were gonna drop it because there are other more sexy things to go for like obesity and um, drug courts and things of that nature, but they didn't have the data and we did. Anyway, I won't go into too much detail on that one. Uh, in, uh, in Google, we're doing this, Jason uh, is in the picture also somewhere, uh, but that's me on the right in the blue shirt over there standing up with the white hair on the right hand side. And we're helping Googlers learn how to use a, a, a self-evaluation to improve their performance and their, their production. Um, we also work at Pacifica Graduate Institute. I teach over there sometimes. Uh, and they're using it to assess their internal activity and also um, uh, externally how they might use it for, once again, accreditation. But the doctoral students are using it to assess their own programs and their own progress within it as part of their, uh, their um, academic work. Very cool. Some of you might be very interested in the fact that we're using this also online. Eric is a part of this team as well. We have about 50 computer science education evaluators and we connect, we used to connect every two weeks. Uh, and now we're doing it about once a month. And many of us have never seen each other before face to face. Uh, we're doing all the empowerment evaluation and we did all the different sessions online. So all this can be, obviously you wanna do stakeholder involvement approaches face to face if you can. This is not possible and also it's appropriate for this group to do a lot of computer uh, science evaluation stuff online. So we have all the steps of mission, taking stock, planning for the future, which I'll breeze through today. Um, and um, uh, we'll highlight how we did that. Uh, we did all of that online remotely using Zoom, Google Docs, Google Sheets, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, uh, just wanted to let you know that we use a lot of technology. You don't have to remember in a township, I may have paper and gum and you just put it up there, the uh, spreadsheets, uh, sorry, the uh, poster sheets, and you write down what the different aspects are of uh, th their thoughts about where we should go. When you have the technology, why not? Uh, and this one's particularly appropriate. Quickly, for those who are not as familiar with this, I'm gonna just breeze through the definition, theory, concept steps very quickly. Uh, so I'm just sort of breeze through here. 
It's basically a, an approach that uses uh, evaluation concepts, techniques, and findings to foster and improve self-determination. It increases the probability, because there are no guarantees in life, of achieving program success. Program stakeholders, um, by helping them get tools to assess their planning, implementation, and self-evaluation of their program, but the key is really to mainstream it so it becomes part of the planning and management of what they do. It doesn't become something secondary or parasitic that people run away from. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. They run towards it to, to want the information. Just to be honest about where I am intellectually, um, uh, um, Marv drew this tree, not me, Marv Alkin, uh, and he's taken some of the top theorists in, the, in the, I guess, the country of the world and um, marked them pretty well, I think, because uh, he has value on one side here. Methods where a lot of people argue I belong because I do a lot of work in ethnography and uh, reactivity for treatment control design. But that was like, um, I think Marv was right. I actually belong where I am over here in this limb ready to fall off over here on the left on use because I've always cared about what you do with this stuff. And certainly with the empowerment stuff, no question about it. And even with my ethnographic work, I've always been involved and in, committed to use. Um, in any case, um, if we have time, I'll tell you a little cute story if you remind me about uh, labeling ourselves uh, in different ways uh, methodologically. But for now, I just want to keep uh, giving you a highlight. Look at this slide a little bit later if you want to have contrast between traditional and uh, empowerment approaches, just so you have a feel for it. But I'll, I'll briefly mention usually you're external if you're traditional, internal if you're empowerment. You're the out expert who knows sort of everything over here for a lot of traditional work. And in empowerment, you're a coach and critical friend helping them out. Uh, in traditional forms of evaluation, we do a phenomenal job of collecting information, survey, you name it. Um, and the problem is we do it correctly, but from a client perspective, community perspective, it's often seen as warehouse because it's not in time with their decision making. Um, so that's a significant issue in the field. We may foster dependency also in the traditional forms of evaluation. In empowerment, you're building capacity, helping people learn how to do this themselves. Um, in, in traditional forms of evaluation, you have independent judgment, which is fantastic. Everyone needs it. But the problem is you can have some great questions about where you should go from independent assessment and judgment, but it may not be where you are on your organizational level of development. And as a consequence, um, it may mess up and destroy your program. Um, you have to have independent judgment. It's invaluable, but on your terms in terms of where you are uh, and your needs at the moment. Uh, in empowerment evaluation, it's always definitely a collaboration. You can't have it just independently, one person or a handful of people in charge. Uh, in traditional forms of evaluation, I've been doing it for 25, 30 years, you really be go, go beyond the actual uh, initial design. And in empowerment evaluation, you're enhancing sustainability because it's endless. Now, having done that fast, broad strokes approach, I want to emphasize they're not mutually exclusive. External and internal can work together beautifully. It's just it should be more on the insider's terms is the key to the extent possible. Also, by the way, empowerment evaluation is not done in a vacuum. I should emphasize it's within the context of what you're being held accountable for already, uh, not just do whatever you want. Uh, we have, is it six hours for, for this presentation? Is that right? Oh, oh, oh did I get that wrong? Oh, oh, okay, I'll do this in a couple of seconds then. Okay, sorry. sorry. I was going to go on for about six hours on theories that, that might everyone might be interested in. You know, what the heck? But we only have a little bit of time, so all right. The un one of the underlying theories of empowerment evaluation is process use. And that really is that the more that people are engaged in the act of conducting their own evaluations, the more likely it is that they'll find the, the, find the results credible and act on them because they're theirs. This in helps one of the biggest problems we have in the entire field knowledge utilization. Most of our stuff is done extremely, extremely well. And I go through literally thousands of pieces a, a year that I review for various purposes. Um, and it's actually pretty high caliber, but it sits and gathers dust very often. Uh, so this enhances knowledge utilization because people want to see something move with it because uh, it's theirs. Other theories I want to emphasize is the theory of action, which is what the organization says they're about, equity, fairness, etc. Theory of use, that's the actual observed behavior. And if you've ever seen this emblem when you're in London or traveling uh, in that area, uh, there's a sign that says, mind the gap. You know, it's between the tube and the platform you might want to fall in. But it's really actually an empowerment symbol. People just don't realize it. And what it is is 
you're constantly mining the gap between what people say they're doing in an in organization and what they really do. And you're trying to, with evaluation feedback, get it closer and closer and closer to close the gap. Key concepts I want you to look at later, if you have to do right now. I just want to focus on a core of empowerment evaluation is, and this is in academic medicine, uh, we wrote an article about what we did for uh, Stanford University's med school, helping get through accreditation, uh, is that you focus on evidence, you have a critical friend that helps facilitate the process, uh, you have a culture of evidence uh, that everyone develops because when they have a rating or an assessment they make verbally, you ask them based on what, and they learn to get even more and more sophisticated over time. You have cycles of reflection and action where you're thinking about what the data says, and then you're acting on it, and then you assess that, et cetera, reflect on it, on and on. It's an endless cycle. You're building a community of learners in the process and reflective practitioners who think about what they're doing all the time to try to improve their practice. Coaching is also, some folks, uh, colleagues of mine said, David, you can't have co coaching. I mean, you just have to make it on your own in life. And I thought to myself, well, he's got a point. And I thought, no. Uh, you have a coach if you want to learn to drive uh, and if you want to uh, race. My daughter, of course, had to uh, have a coach for uh, volleyball and certainly for vol, you know, for jumping uh, with her horse. I mean, like, I'm not going to let her just do whatever. In medicine, you think I'm letting my students just go and do an operation or something like that. They're, of course, going to be a coach. And I used to have my exercise used to be just going from the parking lot to the uh, office to teach and to do, you know, or go on a plane to go do some consulting. Uh, for the coaching part, I was not going to kill my back. I went to a gym. I got a coach. Uh, but also, you have you know a financial advisor. We all have coaches, so why not an evaluation as well? We in our empowerment work in Arkansas, they, they, they we're helping people. This is Linda Delaney, one of people, one of my uh, folks who worked in my my group, um, in my firm. She's helping to facilitate a large group over there on uh, tobacco prevention um, and keeping them all sort of on target, but it's their evaluation. These are some of the principles you can look at. We have a whole book on this, but I just want to emphasize that it's aimed towards improvement, community ownership, inclusion. Inclusion is important. Let me just tell you, I've got a couple seconds. Um, when I was the president of uh, AEA, I wanted to be something powerful uh, because I'm introducing a whole new approach at that time. It's like 21 years ago or so, or 22. Um, so I basically hired someone to help me out and present all this. Yep, I hired Einstein. And you're saying, well, is it, wasn't he dead already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hired an actor who may believe he was Einstein and I taught him about evaluation for six months and about empowerment evaluation. So when people introduced, I started, you know, when he started talking, people started going, oh my gosh, he's brilliant. Well, he used Einstein's words, but he also connected it with what he knew now about evaluation. The reason I mention this at all is that um, we had uh, a situation where he had those microphones that you have on your side and your hip, uh, your remote ones you can walk around with, and it broke. It wasn't working right. So it sounded like I, I, you couldn't hear his words. It was sort of all muffled. Uh, but I saw the crack in it. So I, because my dad used to teach me about all these just mechanical things, I could see if I connected that, the battery would connect, everything would be fine. I grabbed a hold of it. Keep in mind, I got a suit on, I got a cowboy hat because it was in Texas. I had all my board members who were stars, so I didn't, you didn't know who they were. If they needed help, it was just cute. But the downside was when I held on to his hips, he just kept on moving. So he's zipping around. I'm going behind him with my suit and the hat and the whole bit, and no one's listening to him because you're watching me dance around him, right? If I let go, it's all muffled like this. Well, there's one guy, is out of thousands of people, who I happen to like. He's a nice guy. A lot of people run away from him because I talk computers twenty you know, computers twenty four seven. But I, I like him. I don't know. I like people from all different kind of backgrounds and um maybe he's from a small town and I am too. I, I don't know. But whatever it is, I, I like him. Who's the one guy who saved all of us by bringing an old fashioned microphone to us? Him. My point is let's go back one slide. Like this. Inclusion. Even your weakest link might save the day for you. So that's a critical aspect. But let me just jump over past democratic participation, social justice, community knowledge, and all the rest. You have to be doing capacity building if you're not, otherwise you're not doing an empowerment evaluation and probably not any kind of stakeholder involvement approach if you're not building capacity. But I just want to highlight accountability for a minute and then uh, I'll close very shortly so we can go to questions. 
for a lot more detail than I can possibly give, of course, in this short presentation and on the principles. We have it in Japanese and other languages on the right. It's in English over here on, on the left. I think that's um, Guilford Press, if I recall, to the one on the left. I just want to highlight three steps. Uh, and um, the, this is important because my mom uh, was a professor also, and she always asked me, did you test them? Uh, and I said, they're adults. You know, I said, did you test them? It's like, so if you wouldn't mind, just put something in the message thing. Uh, how many steps are there to empowerment evaluation? I'll, I'll give you a hint, <coughs> uh, three steps. Just plunk it in there. I'll actually be talking to my mom. She's 91, and she'll actually ask me that question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nikki, you, you, this is for real. I actually will be, um, she'll be asking me, and it's like, yep, mom, I asked them. So you're good. Thanks so much. Briefly, I'll go over real quick. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take, if you don't mind, a computer screen snapshot of this. Uh, here we go, like this. And we go. Thumbs up. Perfect. So this one, I make sure. Well, you think I'm kidding? My mom is fantastic. A really great role model. Um, and she, but she is very much like, I want them to learn. You know, it's very important. So let me breeze through this. Uh, uh, th thanks. Uh, thanks for the comments. I see very nicely. Okay. Um, mission, and it's, I'm only going to highlight because we don't have a lot of time. But you get the idea. Mission is the first thing. We're going to go to then take taking stock briefly, planning for the future. That's it. That's all there is. You, you know, that's empowerment evaluation. You have folks write on a poster sheet what their mission is. It's democratic, very transparent. You're getting at the group values. That's what the core is. And you honor any existing mission, but you want to go where the energy is in the room. And briefly, giving voice and making meaning. You probably know what this is, but haven't seen the term. Have you ever been in a, in a meeting and you've had a comment and it's ignored? Or worse, you have a comment and you put down for it. I know, you've experienced that. Interesting, huh? Get this. Have you ever been in a meeting where you have said something? No response. Someone says that has more stature than you. It's the same exact thing. And everyone goes, oh, what a good comment. Yeah, it looks familiar, isn't it? Interesting. That's not being allowed to give a voice or make meaning. Empowerment evaluation doesn't allow that to, to happen. Uh, you are compelled to have your voice heard, as you'll see in a moment. Let's move to taking stock, part one. I just asked everyone, what are the most important things that make that mission possible? And it could be communication, it could be funding, it could be teaching, it could be whatever it is that's germane. And it can go on to 50, 60 items, doesn't matter. Whatever it takes. It's just brainstorming. But then I tend to use dots. Every, you know, sticky, very California esque, I know. But everyone gets five dots, and you get to put them on the thing that you think is the most important activity for us to evaluate as a group from this point on. And a lot of folks say to me, David, it's not very quantitative. I go, count the dots. You know, it's like, Whatever got the most dots, and then, uh, oh, thanks, sure. Whatever got the most dots, that's what you go for, uh, the top 10 of those items. I put those in a spreadsheet, and then say, in this case, communication came up as one of the most important things the group wants to see. Teaching, next, funding, product development. And this is a, an abbreviated example of a real one we did through um, accreditation in a school in uh, uh, San Francisco. California Institute of Integral Studies. So you rate it 10 if everything's going perfect, one terrible if it's terrible. Uh, and this is a real example with communication. I put it as a three, that's my initials, by the way. Nothing confidential about this approach. So very different than our normal evaluation approach. But I have to know, because I need to ask you why I gave a certain rating. And you'll see why that's critical. I give it a three and I say, we don't have any agendas. We have uh, duplication of meetings, overlapping meetings. I give all this long explanation, evidence. The SEC happens to be a secretary. She is a better social, social scientist than me. She actually has the written documents to show the overlapping record of scheduling, but she couldn't do anything about it. So who gives it a six? The dean. So I ask very, uh, uh, I said, she wants me to ask because it's not going to be in politics, you know, that's why I always have a brief, big group session. She elbows me, would you mind asking David about that? I go, okay. Why did you give it a six? And explain why, you know, why I thought it was so bad. He said, from his perspective as the dean, we actually communicate very well compared to the entire institute. Well, if we'd only done a survey, we never would have known that. It's the dialogue and the communication that allows us to know we have to have two levels of communication, one internal and one external. Based on that, he changes his ratings. Once again, an anathema in normal evaluation, you don't change the data. Like, yeah, of course you do. After dialogue, we can be more honest and accurate because we know more information. Anyway. 
As you can see, we also total and average it across. That allows you to have this minority opinion of a nine or a one, and it's in your face, so you're not, you can't forget about it, but they don't take over just because they're articulate uh, or charismatic or extreme or whatever. I should mention one other one where on the one and six, that's where I was completely wrong. I didn't see anything going on with brochures going out to help students know about the program and recruit folks. And also, she didn't know much about it either. He gave it an eight. Going, Great, the dean gives everything, you know, a high score. No. He puts out hundreds of brochures. He does TV marketing stuff on public radio, public television and public radio. He does a ton of stuff. But none of us knew it. His office is one office away from me. Anyway, my point is, Sometimes it's illuminating, not just evaluative, when you're doing this. I mean, Eric also referred to learning, and that's part of this process, is that you're constantly learning. Um, and his failure, as it were, to the extent you fail, was he didn't communicate internally very well, which let him know he had to do that more as a basis of this. Now, the core of what I want to say here, it's critical, is that the evidence we give in this section tells us what we need to do to plan for the future. When we go to plan for the future, it's the evidence that tells us what to do. I could come up with this great idea of how to improve communication. And I did actually have this, you know, kiosk thing electronically and everything else. But so what? What mattered was the thing that concerned them, which is the overlap of the meetings, the agenda. So you know, now I have to have an agenda. I have to now also have um, uh, reduced overlapping meetings rather than some arbitrary sense of things that might be good in general for communication. Anyway. Are powerful. So every step that I mentioned plants the seed for the next step. Anyway, as you can see, we total and average across and all the way down. Look at this. Give a 4.33. Not unusual in empowerment evaluation for people. People give a low rating because it's they're making the assessment of their own performance. If you give them an opportunity to say where they do well, then they're more open about where they might not be so. Uh, and also if you break it down. Remember, if I gave it a 4.33, just walking into place, they say, David, go back home. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know us very well, et cetera. If they give it to themselves, which is what happened, they go, David, how can you help us? It changes the dynamic of the role of our relationship and of evaluation. Anyway, I'll go on because I know I have to move quick. Planning for the future. Um, now we know the goal should be to improve communication. Strategies, let's not have uh, overlapping meetings. See what I mean? Let's have an agenda. And then we have a, a dashboard to monitor this. By the way, this is a, one of some of our online group over here. It's me and it's Jason. We have a lot of our folks, Kara, Kathy, who are involved in, once again, the computer education evaluation uh, activity, doing all of this online just to show you using Google Sheets. All the things I've just mentioned, even though I like them face-to-face, -face, can be done online. I want to make sure you see this because you can do this for anything. So even though I'll cut this uh, short in a second or two, I want you to see this. It's an evaluation dashboard that we developed in empowerment evaluation, but you can use it for anything. You have goals, you have milestones, actual performance, and baseline. Watch this. It's so cool. We have a tobacco prevention program in Arkansas going, and we'll have, say, the baseline's one or zero, whatever it may be. Your goal is to have just four in one in one year, which sounds like small for a county. That's really an amazing task, actually. If you don't know what you're doing, you just divide by four. I want one in the first quarter. One more the next quarter, one more the next, one more the next. When you know what you're doing, then you go zero because you know you they don't even meet for a policy decision in the county to make a smoke-free park signage or a policy at all. But at first, you just break it down the best way you can. Once you agree on your baseline goals and milestones at the beginning of the year, the only thing you ask the group to do is put down their performance. So if it's zero, oh, you don't slap anybody in the wrist. You go, okay, so let's get somebody who knows how to do that in the group. You come on over, show us what to do. They give their story about what worked. You adapt it. You work on it. Boom. You actually are successful before it's too late. You just do it iteratively all across the year. It could look like a bar chart like this, by the way, you know, where you have actual milestones, actual milestones. And then, oh, third quarter, you're actually meeting it. Fourth, you're more likely to get there instead of you know, waiting until the last minute. Sometimes in the second quarter. Hi, David. Sorry, I have to interrupt you. Um, we have gone a bit over time. Um, your presentation has been fascinating and there has been a lot of participation and very interesting questions. Uh, but unfortunately, we need to move on to the questions before um, our next presenter. And we will only have time for one. 
um, unfortunately, but I encourage all the people who ask questions to um, contact David and uh, participate also in, um, in our social media, sharing questions and comments. Um, so the question I'm going to share with you is from Hayat Askar. He asked uh, if there isn't a, a big risk of bias in this uh, type of evaluation and how, um, and if there is uh, this risk, how can we avoid it? Um, I'm going to give you back the floor now. Uh, again, sorry for having had to um, cut you short. Um, and also to remind you that we have uh, only a couple minutes for um, Q&A now. I'm giving you back the floor. No problem, don't worry. That was pretty much close to the last slide anyway that I want to highlight, just so you can see how the dashboard works and you can hit amazing heights if you use this kind of approach where you have stakeholder involvement. You want bias. I know, scary thought, huh? What you're looking for is all of the individual and group biases about what they want. Empowerment evaluation is about finding common denominators of vested interest. It's not just humanitarian and wonderful. You want to know what your bias is based on hopefully evidence, and you get all of those and you pull them together to see what the common denominator are. Very quickly, because I know we have to close. In, in uh, East Palo Alto, I work with Latinos, uh, African Americans, Pacific Islanders who don't necessarily get along with each other. But I, I say, let's, let's raise our hand. How many of us want to help improve education? Hands go up. Who want to improve security? Hands go up. Who wants to work on housing? We couldn't get agreement, so we don't work on that. We work on common vested interest. But I know what you're getting at with the bias aspect. You'll find that in general with empowerment evaluation uh, and self-assessments in general, and look at the literature on it, uh, what you have is two things going on. One, people, because they care about the program are, and, and want to see it work like for dropouts, they are more critical about it, number one. And number two, with empowerment evaluation, it's their first window, usually, for people to fix something that's broken every day in their life. And what they want to do is to be as honest because they want it to work and not have to go to work every day or in their community and see something broken. They're too tired of also not seeing their kids get the benefits they should be just because they're you know, living in a minority community and they're given second and, and third quality uh, uh, education and, uh, and benefits. They want to see this opportunity, so they're very critical of themselves. Hope that's not too fast, but it gives you an idea of why bias is actually positive sometimes, but I know what you're getting at for the bias as far as the assessment. I usually find it's much more critical than anyone from outside who often has to worry about their job doing an evaluation the next time, whereas someone internally who definitely knows I live this and I want it to be the better for my community and my, my family. Hope that's not too fast uh, as a quick response. Sorry for uh, going a little bit over. Glad you hung in there. Uh, obviously, I find this very exciting stuff that you're doing here. And once again, this can be done with youth as we have in our book uh, and have done for many years uh, in different levels of engagement doing their own self-evaluation or empowerment evaluation. But thanks.